Well, just when you thought you didn't have enough of leadership contests, along comes another one, with <laughs> Nigel Farage stepping down today. Ignore the suggestion he's gunning for jobs as presenter of Top Gear. He wanted his life back, he said, having seen the main goal of his political life accomplished. So, what happens to UKIP now? Well, here are three things the party needs to decide. And just to warn you, there is some flash photography in this. Decision one for UKIP. What kind of party is it when it comes to issues other than the EU? Most parties are messy coalitions of different factions, and that's as true of UKIP as it is for the old established rivals. One wing is more conservative than the Conservatives. Tough on welfare and crime, it believes in a small state, lower taxes and less borrowing. By cutting taxes by £18 billion, I think there is a very strong argument right. that says that will lead to dynamic growth within the economy. And we certainly saw examples of this. The natural goal of Conservative UKIP is the taking of Tory seats. But that may be harder with the Tory party taking Britain out of the EU. But there's another UKIP as well, the blue collar champion, sometimes called Red UKIP, the party that wants to take seats from Labour. It puts more emphasis on beating up the rich and getting companies to pay their share of taxes. It wants to preserve the welfare state. It's the UKIP of its former economic spokesman, Patrick O'Flynn. The very big multinationals are, you know, excessively uh, taking advantage of uh, aggressive tax avoidance schemes. There's no doubt about that. Well, and I some don't, of them I don't are, want some are, some aren't. I don't want to be like that, that to be a point Come on, that, that is purely why, a left-wing point, because I don't think it should trust be. Decision two for UKIP, what kind of tone should it adopt? The party is united on Euroscepticism, patriotism and a desire to control immigration, but not united in the way it talks about immigration in particular. Will a new leader try to ramp up the rhetoric or try to appear more conciliatory? There are those who are basically Faragists who would continue the basic message that UKIP has at the moment, which is make sure the government delivers on restrictions around free movement, put in an Australian-based point system, reform Westminster, and ensure that Brexit is delivered 100%. There are others, I think, who, irrespective of what happens in terms of Britain's relationship with Europe, would want to push UKIP down a more strident line on social and cultural issues, campaigning more exclusively against Islam and immigration. And a third decision, how to make UKIP a more professional operation. More members, more backing, more seats. Doing all of that with a Farage-sized hole in the middle. There was a remarkable contradiction almost during the referendum campaign, which is on the one hand, UKIP sort of delivers its lifelong goal of Brexit. But on the other hand, throughout that campaign, the party probably only attracted around a thousand new members. Under the surface, behind Farage's sound bites, behind the national discussion and debates, I think something within UKIP has not quite clicked. Matthew Goodwin, who's uh, spent several years studying UKIP as an academic. Uh, well, I'm joined now in the studio by Peter Whittle, a London Assembly member and UKIP's candidate for the mayor of London uh, earlier this year. Raheem Kassam, who was chief advisor to Nigel Farage during the last general election. And we're also joined from the Strasbourg uh, Parliament, the European Parliament, by Margot Parker, UKIP MEP for the East Midlands. Thanks all very much indeed. Just a quick question. Are you uh, any of you thinking of standing or going to stand? Raheem, are you a candidate? Maybe, maybe. Maybe? Yeah, we'll see. Peter, we'll see. I think we're all thinking about it. I mean, obviously, the whole events of the day sinking in. Uh, but there's a huge amount of talent in UKIP now. And uh, so uh, I think there's a lot to choose from. Right. And Margot, are you a candidate or who are you supporting if you're not? Well, we're all candidates. We're all supporting all of the talent that, frankly, that UKIP has to offer. And we have a lot of talent for sure. Right. Well, look, let's um, ask about the tone question. Um, Raheem, do you think the tone should perhaps reach out to a broader swathe of population? Do you think it should be toned down? Were you a supporter of the Breaking Point poster? 
for example? I think the breaking point poster was clumsy looking. I think the, the, the how it was executed was actually very bad. Um, but actually the message was fine. You know, that was a real picture um, from Southern Europe from 2015. Nobody complained when it was on the front page of The Independent and The Guardian. Um, and the message was sort of mixed up with... It didn't really make clear what it was talking about. And that was the failure of the European Union to manage migration. So I think what we come on to in terms of tone is actually execution and professionalism rather than, and that's something I talked about last year when I left uh, uh, my position. Margot, what about you, that poster? You've undoubtedly seen it over there in, uh, in Strasbourg. Well, yes, I, I'm, I reiterate really what Rahim has said. Um, it had been there, it had been you know, previously out there and it perhaps was a little bit clumsily executed, but the message was there. Um, and you didn't and, think and it was too much people are... hate in it? I mean, you didn't think it was, you know, a lot of people have been very critical, haven't they? Well, they have. I mean, I, I wouldn't use the word hater. Lots of people do, but it's not really appropriate. It wasn't right. People said to me, well, they're refugees, but of course you couldn't possibly know whether they were all refugees or not. It was just a picture that had been out in the media. It was selected. The message, indeed, exactly as Rahima said, perhaps didn't get across in a more sensitive way. Peter, were you, were you happy with that poster? Or um, is the party all behind that, that tone of that poster? No, no, I don't, um, I don't think... I didn't have a problem particularly with it. I think that uh, when you went outside of the Westminster Bible, I think a lot of people knew what the poster was saying. Um, and I don't think, really, that uh, it was as badly taken as, as has been discussed. Okay. But I think that the, the, the main point, really, is that, um, you know, tone or no tone, um, a lot of people, particularly in the Westminster bubble, think that even talking about immigration is the wrong tone. Right. And, well, I mean, we, that's something we should never stop doing. Yeah, we do talk about it a lot. Raheem, what about Nigel Farage's performance in the European Parliament last week when he... Magnificent. Yeah. He's Absolutely magnificent. <laughs> magnificent. I mean, you have to you have like context. That. Yeah. I think you have to have context behind this. If you've been inside the European Parliament, if you've been inside the Chamber, if you've watched the proceedings, you know they're always mm. all giving it to each yeah. other. You know, there's, there's all these robust exchanges, and it's actually pretty funny. And they go out smoking with each other, and they go out drinking with each other after it, Margot and, will and tell Farage you. And Farage does the same with them all, does he? He goes yeah, out smoking. He gives, they he, get on. They he, all love it. They all get along. You've yeah. seen the pictures of have him. Have you ever had a real yeah. job, Raheem? Yourself? I have had a real what job. I've real worked job? in retail. I've worked in three different retail jobs. I've worked in a bar. I've worked real jobs. These are casual jobs. Yeah. Okay. Fine. But I was paying. I was. Uh, you know. I was working them full time. I've worked in a call centre full time after right. university. I know what real jobs are. Right. Is this a leadership? No. Context? No. No. I just. I just wondered. <laughs> he was so fond of what, what Farage had been saying. Um, let's talk about this kind of left right. I mean, Peter Whittle. Yeah. If you were running the party. Would you try and take it a little more towards appealing to the Labour voters, of whom there are very many, and Labour's in a shaky place at the moment? Or would you say, look, it's, it's, it's shyer voters, former Tories, who want a bit more Tory? No, I think, look, all the elections I've stood in, I mean, whether it's the mayoralty or indeed at the general election, um, anecdotally, empirically, the people who were coming across to UKIP in the greatest numbers, without question, were Labour. And I think that uh, this is the great opportunity for UKIP going forward. I think that there's no question about it. We all know from the referendum campaign that it was basically in the north that the referendum was won. Uh, people who are largely forgotten by people down here. I say that as a Londoner. Um, and in fact, that is where um, our support and the growth in our support lies and I think that therefore those are people or just to add those are people who are patriotic people but they believe also in the NHS and they have right. a great sense of social justice too. Do you agree with that Margot that, that that's where you have to look for votes and if that means giving up some of the more Tory talk about smaller governments and big tax cuts and such like so be it? Well I think um Yes, Peter's absolutely right. In fact, uh, when we toured in the MEP battle bus, we really went to the north of England and we had tremendous reception there. Uh, our market stalls, uh, our door knocking. In fact, we worked cross party, but we had a great response from Labour voters. They seriously did connect with us. But, you know, this has been going on for years. This isn't a new thing. You know, we listened to them. Yeah. We knew that they were being neglected because they told us about their problems. We actually listened. So, of course, you know, we, we had a more sensitive manifesto. We want to do things that actually help people. And it's not just words. We actually believe it, and we do think there is a very, very big opening here to be able to move forward and genuinely help people. But because if we don't, 
you know, the country needs needs help now. But it does, needs the, a decent but party does the party to need to change? Forward. Sorry to interrupt, but does the party need to change its message in order to so hone in on those voters to kind of refine its appeal to those voters? Well, I mean, we are moving on. You know, the, the, the party has expanded. Um, we certainly need to put the structure there so that we can cope with the membership that we've got. And, of course, loads and loads of people are calling us all sorts of, I don't know, times of the day. I mean, my office is constantly getting calls from people asking us questions. What can you do? Could you help me here? I've got a problem. So we are being called in even as MEPs, would you believe, uh, to help for some of the things that are going on in the United Kingdom, which, of course, being a member of the EU, doesn't necessarily involve it. its its practical issues that people are looking for help for. Can, can I add also, actually, to what Marco said there, is that the people who are active in UKIP, I mean, whether this is at council level, or whether it's at just pure activist level, it's often hard to tell whether they are ex-Labour or ex-Tory. It, it is purely come, if you like, from both. The idea that this is something to do with the shires, I mean, I think possibly if we've been having this conversation in 2010, maybe, but not anymore. OK. We're going to need to leave it there. Thank you all very much indeed. indeed.